Arab Spring shook the foundations of the Middle East. Across the region, millions went on to elect, not secular, but Islamic leaders. In Egypt, however, the Muslim Brotherhood were confronted by mass protests and ousted by the army. So can political Islam or Islamism work in a democracy? I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with Professor Tariq Ramadan, whose grandfather founded the Muslim Brotherhood. Ranked by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people on earth, his call for reform within the Islamic world has triggered both widespread support and outrage from both Muslims and non-Muslims alike. To debate these issues, I'll also be joined by Anas Al-Tikriti, a political activist and supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood. Journalist Yasmin Alibai Brown, founder of British Muslims for Secular Democracy, and Professor Alan Johnson from the pro-Israeli lobby group BICOM. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Professor Tariq Ramadan. Muslim by religion, European by culture, he says he wants to bridge the gap between East and West. Tariq, how political is the religion of Islam in your view? Is it possible to take politics out of Islam? I would say we should never, ever distinguish or separate or divorce politics from ethics and ethics has to do with religion the point for me is never to come with religion as a dogmatic understanding a dogmatic system and imposing onto politics religion how do you define the word islamism and how do you distinguish it from the religion of islam this was in fact a, a concept that came from within the muslim brotherhood in the 50s in jail where a, a, a group of people were, was saying the only true Muslims are us and Nasser is no longer a Muslim. The mainstream Muslim Brotherhood movement said no, we are Islamiyun and we are all Muslims, Muslimun, meaning that the Islamists have a social project, a political project, as, a, as different from Muslims who are practicing Muslims and believers. So there is something here which has to do with a political a, a vision about the state, but also a vision about the society. But given it's a word that's applied to the Turkish government and to the Taliban, to the Tunisian government and to Al-Qaeda, is it a useful term? That, that's the very good point. I think that we need a qualification. Today, when we speak about Islamism, we don't know what we are talking about because this is what is coming sometimes from the West and sometimes from secularists in Muslim-majority countries saying, you know what, at the end, they are all the same. They all want what bin Laden wanted. So when people in the West in particular, but not just in the West, in the Muslim-majority countries as well, talk about the threat of Islamism to democracy, to human rights, uh, is that something that you disagree with? Do you think that's, that's a excessive criticism, an unfair criticism? Th that's based on nothing but projection and, and nonsense. They have a selective approach towards democracy. If it suits them, that's fine. So the point for me is to put all the Islamists as saying that they are against democracy, it's, it's completely <coughs> wrong. In fact, if you look at what is happening in Turkey, 10 years ago, when people were talking about Erdogan, they were saying he's going to apply Sharia, implement Sharia, and there will be no democracy. At the end, he's much more democratic, uh, uh, and he's much more a Democrat than the military, and even some secularists who are ready to use the army against the democratic process. If you look at what's going on in Turkey at the moment, which is embroiled in, has been embroiled in violent protests, uh, accusations of corruption, uh, infighting, you look at Hamas in Gaza, there are some who would say that Islamist groups are very good at being in opposition, not so good at governing, not so good at taking charge. Wherever they come to power, there seems to be problems, chaos, human rights violations. There are lots of, lots of things to do still in Turkey to get uh, a free society uh, respecting minorities, that's for sure. But if you look at all the other countries, Turkey is much better okay. than many. Just on the Arab Spring more generally, Am I right in saying that you have refused to call it a spring or even a revolution? And if so, what would you call it? What no, we've I, seen in the Arab world? 
I think that from the beginning, I never uh, uh, bought the idea that these were revolutions. If you try to tell me that all what happened on the ground was not known by the West, I don't buy this. This is nonsense. And I said from the very beginning, we are too much focusing on the political equation of what is happening, while the big, big question is the economic side of the equation. This has to do with economy and new actors in the region. In your book, The Arab Awakening, which you wrote on this, you also talk about the role of America, you talk about the role of Completely, Israel, yeah. you talk about the role of multinational corporations. Many people would say you sound like a conspiracy theorist. Who decided not to talk about the coup d'etat in order to support the army. The was the, the revolution the, the itself against Mubarak run from the White House? No, 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 please, don't, don't, don't trans, tr translate what I'm saying no, in the book. That was my question. Well, no, what I'm saying in the book is that even Mubarak knew about this mobilization of cyber dissidents, and this was known. What I was say I'm saying in the book that the only country in which I think it was not expected, paradoxically, was <coughs> Syria because it took eight months to the US administration to find the people with whom they can work. Some Egyptians I speak to say he's patronizing us because he basically is implying that we're pawns, we're dupes of a Western plot. You talk about Google in your book. You say Google has exactly the same agenda as NATO. Tell me why Google organized the first meeting in Budapest of cyber dissidents coming from the Middle East two years before. You tell me why. I'm telling you that this is coming from a support. I don't buy this idea that everything that happened in the Middle East was coming out of nothing. So this is what I'm saying now. To tell me that I'm patronizing the people, no. I think that the people were sincere and the people were strong. And this is why I still call it an awakening. The Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt, won elections, parliamentary and presidential. Just before we go any further, you mentioned, and I want to talk about your grandfather in a moment, that your grandfather founded the Muslim Brotherhood. Are you a member of the Muslim Brotherhood? No, I'm not. Have you ever been a member of the Muslim no, Brotherhood? No, I never, I never won been. But would it be fair to say that when the Muslim Brotherhood won those elections, you weren't as worried, perhaps, as some people in the West, as some people in Egypt were, about the scary brothers are going to come and take over the world, and you thought, actually, this could work? No, I was worried, but not for the same reasons. I was not worried because I, I was thinking that this is a terrorist uh, group and they were going to act against, uh, uh, against you know, freedom. And, against democracy and, uh, and human rights? Yes, this was not my worry. My worry was that I said it and I wrote it, it is in the book. Don't run for presidency, it's a trap. Surely Morsi's presidency was a disaster when it came to issues like transparency, uh, dealing with sectarianism, protecting minorities, protecting human rights redressing the security forces abuses. It was an absolute uh, disaster, both for the Muslim Brotherhood and for Egypt. One point which is essential for me, anything that they were saying about the economy for me was wrong. And anything that they were uh, uh, say, uh, saying about you know, Egypt for the Egyptian was wrong. In June last year, 20 leading Egyptian human rights groups wrote a letter to President Morsi in which they accused him of trying to establish, quote, a new authoritarian regime in place of the Mubarak regime, of entrenching both religious and political despotism, of paving the way for, quote, a theocracy similar to the Iranian model. Pretty damning criticism. I don't think it's fair with what he was trying to do. We know now how much the deep state in, this, in Egypt was working and the army behind the whole thing. He was working with the army, though. President that's, Morsi that's didn't do anything point. about no, the army. No, no, no. No, no. The Muslim Brotherhood wanted to co-opt no, the no, army. No, he was, not, he was not working with the army. The army was playing with him. This is another story. So the point here is the army was playing with Morsi. And he was very naive. And the Muslim brothers were naive in the way they were in yes, charge. Now, let me tell you. No, 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 naive let word you use. Sorry, this naive word you use. When you're inciting mob violence, when you're inciting violence against Christians or threats against minorities, I don't, when I don't you're telling that. your supporters to go and lay siege to a constitutional court, that's not naive. No, 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 no. no. I think that you are not right on facts. That's here. what the human rights groups are saying no, on the no, ground. No, not, not, not only the, the human rights are. I, I want to know who said that, because this well, is also well, coming I give you an example. 20 Egyptian human rights groups said that. Amnesty International said that. Human Rights Watch said that. So, are they so all the part of a no, let me conspiracy? Tell you, let me tell you something. No, no, not a conspiracy. When I, President I Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood, within months of becoming president, basically gave himself near dictatorial powers in November 2012, Mohammed al-Baradai, one of the opposition leaders, I know you're not a fan of his, called him Egypt's new pharaoh. That wasn't naive, that wasn't a mistake, that was that a power grab. That's true. That was a power that's grab. Right. Yeah.
That was wrong. But I am telling you, after all what happened in Egypt, in one year, yeah. to try to change the country without taking into account the role of the other players. That's a very the valid point. That's, that's, that's valid the point. only thing well, that I want to say. Let's deal with the actual toppling of him. The actual coup itself and the millions of people who took to the street, you call them, uh, you say they were unwitting participants in a media military operation of the highest order. What I'm saying is that the army was very powerful in playing the media. I agree. Now, now, I agree and you agree with that. dispute that. But having said that, there were millions of Egyptians on the street Complete, who welcomed completely. the army. What and do you say to them? I'm saying, I'm saying that they were used by the army even though I'm saying. Millions of people were all used. They didn't come out of their independent no. views, independent thought. They didn't no, have no, agency no. of their own. No, no, they were all pawns. No, no. They had no electricity. Every two hours, no electricity. So the people were pushed. Now, if you think that the American were just observing what happened and not supporting the army, it means that you don't know the story of Sisi. Given that they were up against a deep state, given they were up against the IMF, given that they were up against the White House, why then did the Muslim Brotherhood perform so badly and how big a hit have Islamist parties taken from what happened in Egypt? It was a very good ad for Islamists being in power, was it, the year Morsi was no, in power? I, I think you're right on that. What is coming or came over the last 15 years from the Islamists is very poor. The people that we have to blame, it's coming from scholars, intellectuals, who are now uh, uh, falling into a trap, which is this polarization between secularists and Islamists, not dealing with the five main problems that we have, corruption, the nature of the state, what does it mean, a civil state with Islamic reference? Second is the role of the army. The third is the economic system and social justice, the role of women and culture and arts. Yasmin Alibai Brown is a columnist, an author, is a founder member of British Muslims for Secular Democracy. Uh, Yasmin, you're a self-described secular Muslim, liberal Muslim. W were you cheering when the Muslim Brotherhood were removed from office in Egypt? Give no, I don't. I think, you know, I think the way the army acted was wrong. But I think, I, I don't get from you, Tariq, any sense at all. You do say, of course they made mistakes. I want more than that. I want a really clear sense from you that the Muslim Brotherhood itself knowingly failed and betrayed the people of Egypt. They failed, and I think that I said this. Now, if you want me just for the sake of pleasing you, saying everything has to be on them and to blame them, I'm sorry, okay. I am not going to say this, why? Because there are other factors and okay. actors that, that push them to fail. Let me bring Just, in. Do you acknowledge this? Do you acknowledge the fact that the deep state didn't let democracy work in Egypt? Say yes or no. No, it was no, both of them, fine. both sides. Okay. Let's bring in Anas al Tikriti, who is the chief executive of the British Muslim group, the Cordoba Foundation. Uh, his father is one of the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood Party in Iraq, I believe. Anas do you share uh, Tariq's, Tariq said that he has criticized Muslim Brotherhood mistakes, uh, human rights abuses. You would accept that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt did a pretty bad job in that 12 months on their own. Put aside all the army abuses, put aside the deep state stuff. We acknowledge that. We can agree on that. Considering all the constraints and all the limitations and the time frame that they were offered, I think that they actually did quite well. The question that I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised you're not asking is now we've had the Muslim Brotherhood basically imprisoned and banned and proscribed for eight, nine months. Egypt is in a hundred times more worse situation, worse situation than it was a year ago. It's officially bankrupt. It's on the verge of civil war. There are abuses like we never saw during the time of Mubarak. 20 Egyptian human rights groups who were involved in the revolution wrote a public letter in June last year saying what is happening now is as bad as under Mubarak, under the Muslim Brotherhood. That's pretty shameful. The Muslim Brotherhood guys were in prison under Mubarak. They take power and then they start carrying out human rights abuses. How does that work? Amnesty themselves acknowledge the fact that during the time of the issuing of that report, there was not one single political prisoner. At this moment of time, we have 13,000 political prisoners. Amnesty International itself acknowledged the fact that during the time of Morsi, in terms of, you talked about sectarianism, there were precisely two churches that were burnt. And precisely 12 other Christians, far more attacks on Christian 12 churches. Christians that were killed. No one knows by whom. On the Muslim Brotherhood Facebook page, 
were there or were there not all sorts of incitement and threats made against Coptic Christians I, I, in Egypt? I, I, I honestly, Mahdi, have never ever looked up the Facebook page for the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> Seriously. No, I'll, I'll, tell, well, that's but I'll tell you this. That's but Mahdi, Ma 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 I'll tell you this. No, no, I'll tell you this. At no stage in modern time Egypt were the Christians given as many seats like the time of, the, uh, of, of Musi. Let's bring in Professor Alan Johnson, who's a writer and an author. He's a senior fellow at BICOM, the Britain-Israel Communications and Research Centre. Do you want to respond uh, to what you've been hearing from Anas? I think what we're hearing tonight is people who are in denial about the scale of the defeat that Islamism suffered in 2013. It took communism 70 years to show it was an exhausted political project. It took Islamism one. Let's register for ourselves but, how but do far they fell. Do you deny the point Tariq has made that there were also outside forces involved? That the United States gov government wasn't neutral in this? That the deep state that Tariq identifies wasn't neutral in this? The Muslim Brotherhood weren't operating on their own, were they, surely? I'm sure, that the, that. I'm sure that the Egyptian army from the moment Morsi was elected were planning how they could regain power. That's, that's what we that Egyptian that. army that's do. We, we certainly agree on this that. Point. That's but that's let's, as we're, as we're talking, Isn't that quite a crucial point if you're no, evaluating that? that that's is. the it's main point. It's certainly part of the picture. If we're talking about Islamists, remember how high the hopes were at the beginning of the year. This was going to be some sort of equivalent to Christian democracy's role to modernize, to democratize. It was going to be a whole new historical phase in which Islamist forces, Muslim Brotherhood led or influenced, were going to take the region into a new world. We are so far from that now. It will never be glad morning ever again for Islamism. You often get very upset when people raise the issue that you're the grandson of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, uh, do, you, do you think that's unfairly raised? I'm proud of who he was and what he did. I don't have a problem with this. Very often when the people are uh, labeling me as the grandson, they haven't read about him, they don't know about him, and they have this very simplistic picture, yeah. he was an Islamist, uh, a backward against the West. I say, I'm sorry, before telling me as an insult that I'm the grandson of Hassan al-Banna, you better read a bit people about him. People who have read about Hassan al-Banna yeah. say that in addition to all the things you say about him, he also took inspiration from European fascist movements, from Hitler, That's from Mussolini. nonsense. Rubbish. He said exactly the opposite. He praised the, quote, German working man Hitler for, quote, immense impact on world politics. He praised the German no, Reich that's for not protecting true. German that's blood not in true. their veins and said Muslims that's should not do true. the same. That's not he didn't true. Write that. No, no, he it's didn't. False. No, no, that's, that's completely the opposite. I'm not pretending to be an expert on Hassan al-Banna. You are. Jessica Stern of Harvard University, who has written a great deal, several books on Islamism and extremism, she says that al-Banna was, quote, strongly influenced by revolutionary totalitarian movements and a fascination with violence. The Brotherhood established links with Nazi Germany, had a paramilitary wing which took on fascist-like slogans and practices. Is she that wrong? That's she's completely totally wrong. wrong. She this, know what she's is, about. this is this is where you have something which is propaganda. So, so this is clear. So, so, when so the wrote, point so is, when he wrote in 1935 in our message, a pamphlet, that Islam has ordained quote the conquest of countries and has quote set out conquerors to carry out the most gracious and blessed of conquests. What was he referring to? No, he was talking about you know the expansion of Islam. So so this is something military that military conquest. Is, no, no, not military conquest. But he was saying we will resist the Zionist project in Israel. If you want me to tell you about uh, the organization and why I disagree is, Very briefly. Is, is, is the way this was translated in political terms within the organization and this is why I think uh, uh, even the Muslim Brotherhood today haven't evolved enough from this position. Well on the Muslim Brotherhood today, just going back to our panel very briefly, Anas you mentioned the locking up of the Muslim Brotherhood, the prescription declaring them a terrorist group. Is the Muslim Brotherhood now finished in Egypt? Actually, it's funny you should ask that because the only winner that comes out of this is the Muslim Brotherhood, and I'll tell you why. Just before Morsi was toppled by a military coup, surveys showed that his popularity had fallen to below 20%. The military coup and the subsequent crackdown on the Egyptian people have actually pumped up the popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood and of Morsi. The military coup, in a very ironic and funny way, has come and salvaged the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay. Actually, Mursi is quite popular. Well, let me bring in Alan Johnson. Tarek Ramadan says the people who bring up the Muslim Brotherhood's past and accuse it of being extremist, of undemocratic, of being, are engaging in propaganda. Mm. It's, it's always propaganda, though. It's, 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 you, you can, never, you can never nail 
tear it down. It's always, I didn't say that, they're a propagandist, don't believe them. Look, it's, there's book upon book upon book about the links between Islamism and the interwar period and European fascism. Is a, and it's a very important point. Do you believe the Muslim Brotherhood today is a fascist organization? No, no, but I think there's a problem with democracy. In 2005, the Muslim Brotherhood's supreme leader said this about democracy. It's like a pair of slippers. You put them on when you go to the bathroom. When you get there, you take them off. Th yes, this is, yes, this is you're not nodding. You're nodding there. Is that I think that's true. And I, I, do, I think what's happened to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, as we know in most Islamic countries, politics and democracy stops when somebody get, comes into power. Which countries but are ruled by the Muslim Brotherhood, Yasmin? No, 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 I'm they're, just saying they're persecuted in, in every single So Muslim I do country. agree with you that we well, could have Hamas waited for that. Hamas is regarded as an option. And Hamas is a very important point. Listen, since 1991, when Islamic parties were, were allowed to be part of the democratic process, they took part fair and square. And on every single occasion, they won fair and square. And on every single occasion, they were then stifled and driven to the extremes, such as the case in Hamas. The world did wrong by Gaza. When Hamas won fair and square and then they isolated Gaza, what they did, they proved to every single one who belied, who did not believe in democracy, that actually Al-Qaeda was right. Al-Qaeda are that right. That didn't justify the Hamas mismanagement of Gaza or the human rights abuses in Gaza, did it? What, what human rights and what There are no oh, human rights abuses under, in Gaza. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Has Hamas committed human rights abuses in Gaza? I'm yes or no? I'm pretty sure they have, similar to every single surrounding country to okay. Gaza. Well, that's an answer. No Tariq, we've got, to, we've got to go to... Let, let go me, I have a problem with the way you are asking questions. I'm because sure it's, you do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I do. Because what was done to Hamas and the people of Gaza after the election, it's as if you chose the wrong people, now you are going to be punished. You and I can agree that what was done to Hamas was wrong. You and I can agree what was done to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt by the military was wrong. But what you, where you and I seem to differ is you don't seem to think that Hamas in Gaza or the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt did that much wrong. I said they were not only mistakes, but they are things that were completely wrong in the way they managed the country. Unacceptable. So unacceptable. Okay. They, no, were I, unacceptable. I, 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 they were unacceptable. Okay. It depends what you are talking about. It depends what you okay. are talking about. Anyway, anything which has to do with human rights, if this is there, it's unacceptable, and I agree. Thank you. Coming from Thank whoever, you. Thank there is no discussion about that. Do the point is that the way you ask the question is as if because they are things that were done wrong, it means that we are taking them accountable and you forget the whole picture. This is my problem with the word mistakes. Aren't you hold, aren't, shouldn't you hold these groups to higher standards if they claim to be following God and Islam and the word of God, etc., etc.? Shouldn't they be held to higher standards? Yes. And do you think they've met those standards? No. No. So isn't that, a real, isn't that a real problem? Are, are there clear answers? They are clear answers because it's the first time you've said no without saying, but what about the deep state? What about Israel? What no. about this? This I'm is my just point. Just judge them on their own actions is what I'm asking. If there were no external actors, hmm. if there was no America intervening, if there was no IMF demanding austerity in yeah. return for loans, if there was no Israeli occupation of Gaza... So there and, is and a lot of if here. Yeah. 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 It's no. important. It's important. Mm. It's important on a conceptual level. Okay. You're an academic. On a conceptual level. <laughs> Here's the question. Do you think then that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or Hamas in Gaza or any of these other Islamist groups in power would have done a good job? They would have been fine had it not been, for, had these factors not been there that you constantly I, I think they would have done better, but I can't judge the people after one year the way it was in Egypt. On that specific note, we have to take a break. In part two, uh, we'll be talking to Professor Tariq Ramadan, who is one of the world's leading authorities on Islam and the West, on whether there is a clash between Islam and the West. We'll also be hearing from our very patient audience here in the Oxford Union. Join us after the break. Welcome back to Head to Head on Al Jazeera. We're talking about Islam, Islamism, political Islam, uh, with Professor Tariq Ramadan, one of the world's leading Muslim thinkers, professor here at Oxford University. Uh, Tariq, is the religion of Islam in need of a reformation in the same way that European Christians underwent a few hundred years ago? No, I think that this is a, a wrong comparison. Uh, in, in historical term, in theological term, uh, I, I would say what I'm advocating is not to reform Islam. Islam doesn't need a reform. What I'm advocating is to reform the Muslim minds. 
meaning that the problem is not in the text. The problem is not the Quran. The Quran for the Muslims is the, the eternal revelation. It's not in the prophetic traditions. The problem that we have is with the readers, is the way we interpret the text sometimes and we are not able to understand things into the historical context and in our specific environment. So reforming the Muslim minds, yes. Reforming Islam, no way. How big a problem do you think it is in 2014 for practicing, believing, pious Muslims, whatever you want to call them, to integrate into modern European societies, into the European mainstream, in the UK, in France, in Germany? I don't think that the word integration is the right word. Uh, you know, I was born and raised in Switzerland. I'm a European by culture. And people keep on repeating, when are you going to be integrated? I say, I'm, I'm sorry, the problem is that your mind is not integrating me, I'm already here at home. The success of integration is to stop talking about integration. So I'm, I'm, we are in the post-integration uh, process and we are dealing with people who don't want, in fact, to acknowledge the fact that Britain, that Germany, that France, that the states are pluralistic societies where Muslim citizens are part of the future of the country. Is there no clash at all between so-called liberal, secular, enlightenment values of Europe uh, and, on, on the other hand, Islamic values, Islamic principles, core Islamic beliefs? There's no tension. No, there is no tension. There are tensions between dogmatic minds. So you have dogmatic secularists. They look at secularism as a new religion. They are transforming the legal system into a new religion. And they are telling you, this is the only way to be free, is to be free the way we are. There are genuine clashes going on on the ground between people who are not far right wing Islamophobes. So for example, many quote unquote liberals who are not racists, uh, are not anti-Muslim, but did have a problem over some Muslims' reactions to the Danish cartoons, to the movie about the Prophet. There were lots of protests That's about that. That was an yeah. issue of yeah, it's free right. speech. Yes. There was this a question about, can Muslims handle the kind of free speech we see in Europe nowadays? This is why I was saying there are clashes between dogmatic minds, meaning secular, dogmatic secularists, but also literalists and sometimes dogmatic Muslims not understanding the environment. Where do you stand on that issue? I'm, I'm, I stand in the middle. So, yeah, that. In the so middle what does that mean, mean in practical terms? Would you have supported terms, a ban I'm, on, no, no, on no, the no, Danish no. cartoons? No, no. I was exactly at the time the uh, uh, cartoon uh, crisis started in, in, in Denmark. And I was saying to the Muslims, look, don't react to this. Take an intellectual critical distance. Tell, we don't like it and leave it. You don't have to apologize for being Muslims. Now you have to understand two things. First, you live in a country and it's not only important to be a citizen. You need to get two things that are important. You are talking about the standards, ethics of citizenship, knowing that you don't only have rights, you have duties. And the duties is your contribution. And the second thing is the sense of belonging. And the sense of belonging is the three L's that I'm talking. No, abide by the law of the country, know the language of the country and be loyal to the country. But you can abide by the law and also call for it to be changed. Gender segregation in the form of separate seating for male and female students at public events, in particular Islamic societies, become very controversial in this country. Where do you stand on that? My position on this, from an Islamic perspective, is that nothing is imposing into the Muslims to separate in public venue. This is what I said 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I was saying this to the Muslims, go ahead, there is no problem. I think that this is not the business of the government. Let's talk Sharia law, a big uh, subject in the, in the West. Sitting in that very seat, not very long ago, your fellow Oxford academic, atheist in chief, Professor Richard Dawkins told me that Sharia law was a threat to human rights uh, because among other things, one of the things he cited was that under Islamic Sharia law, if you try and convert away from Islam, to convert to Christianity or Judaism or atheism, the punishment is death. Yes, the problem with Dawkins is that he has to, to learn much more about religions and Islam. He is as knowledgeable in science that he is ignorant in religions. All the, what he's saying about Sharia is coming from media uh, articles. He's not coming from an in-depth study. There are Muslim majority countries that have the death penalty of apostasy on their statute books, are there not? Yes, but this is what, once again, if you take one interpretation and you can do whatever with Christianity, Judaism and any, even Buddhism, 
You can just have very dogmatic views. You have to take the whole picture and to study it. For me, Sharia is not a set of law. Sharia is a way. It's a way towards faithfulness and principles, and it has to do with dignity and justice and, and, and freedom. But I understand that in our societies in the West, the word is used in a way, and sometimes, you know, literalists are using it in Muslims. a very... Yes, yeah. exactly, and this is where we need to have an internal debate. Another capital punishment under quote-unquote Sharia law uh, is often the punishment for adultery, that if people cheat on their partners in some Islamic countries, the penalty is stoning. And you got into a very heated argument back in, I think, 2003, uh, when Nicolas Sarkozy, who later went on to become president of France, uh, in which he demanded you condemn it and say it was wrong, and you would only say that you support a moratorium, a temporary pulp to stoning of women in particular in the Muslim majority world. A lot of people said that was a cop-out by you. you. Why didn't you come out and say, no, it's wrong, in the same way that you said apostasy, death penalty is wrong, it's also wrong for adultery. There are texts in the Qur'an talking about uh, corporal punishment and death penalty. And there are texts in the prophetic tradition talking about stoning. My position on this, what do the texts say? What are the conditions in which social and political context? And we need to have an internal debate. While so you're having why the debate, why stop. not state your position? Which is? I'm against this. Because it. Why? Because it's wrong or because it's outdated or because what's the actual reason? Because all the conditions and the understanding, the very essence of the text and the objectives is not respected if we implement this. I'm not saying it to please Sarkozy or to please a Western audience. I'm saying it in the name of Islam. Alan Johnson uh, is a journalist. You wrote an article recently in which you accused uh, Tariq Ramadan of being a coward for only calling for a moratorium on this issue. He says he's trying to win a debate within the Muslim community. You're saying he's a coward. Yes, I mean, I'd like, you, the, the I'd like to know no, what the... I'd like to know what Yeah, I think it was cowardly. Um, I, I don't think when women are being stoned, I think it's up to Democrats to take a firm position and take a stand and stand up for those women who are being stoned. Muslims are integrating, there's a silent revolution going on. You're not offering those people who are trying to make that silent revolution anything useful. My position on this is from within the universe of reference as Muslims to move on. And it's not going to please you, but you need to understand that Muslims will get to a point where they understand the position. Why don't you lead and let make me, let the me, case? Let me, let me, I'm, I'm not, got a lot of moral It's not for you, you to tell me if I lead debate. or not. I'm just trying to share views with my fellow uh, 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 Muslims. When in the States, in 2000, look at this, I said, if I was an American, I would be against death penalty in this society. I got Muslim leaders coming to me saying, how can you say this because this is Islamic? You know what the Fifth Council now is saying? We are for a technical moratorium on death penalty in the States. Why don't you criticize Amnesty International saying in the States we are for moratorium on death penalty? Why? Are they coward? Okay, let him answer briefly and then <laughs> let Alan come back in. Very briefly, Alan. So you say it's not an issue in the UK of stoning, absolutely right, but many things that are issues, let's take for instance, you write a foreword to a book of fatwas by Kuradawi, Kuradawi stands for it's okay to beat your wife as long as you don't leave a wound. On many issues I, I took position against Kandawi's position. Th you, this is written, and I said it, and I said it to him, and him publicly, he was against my position. Now, let me tell you something. That for anyone who is living in the West, Yusuf al-Qardawi, with his contribution, made this Muslims in the West understand better their religion and their relationship to the West. I'm not supporting all his views, but I would never let anybody say that all what he did after 50 years working in the Islamic field, that he's the one who is a dogmatic mind. Let me bring in Yasmin Aliwa Brown, journalist, author, founder, member of British Muslims for Secular Democracy. Yasmin, a lot of people, Muslim and non-Muslim, say Tariq is part of the solution. Tariq is helping Muslims modernize, reform, etc. And others, like Alan, say he's part of the problem, no. he's not part of the... I Where do you stand? I admire a lot of what Tariq has done, and some of what he said was persuasive. But I do want to hear from you that there is no moratorium on, on stoning. It is wrong, and it should never happen. I want to hear a direct sentence like that. Go on, then answer the question. Can you give her that sentence? 
No, I'm not going to give this sentence. Okay. I'm going to give you. That's what's no. wrong. No. That's what's wrong. No. What is wrong is the dogmatic way you are. You put the questions. No, this is dogmatic way. Is no debates, just condemn. Stoning Let me tell you anybody something. is wrong. Let me tell you something. Between you and me, as if there is nobody here, <laughs> even stoning is problematic, relying on the scriptural sources. If you think by saying, I condemn, and that's it, without coming to the scriptural sources, starting a discussion about the reasons, the context, history, this is the way you, you change mindsets. Uh, Anasal Sakriti, you work in British Muslim communities, you've worked across the Middle East. You would accept that there is a real tension, surely, is there not, over issues like uh, corporal punishment, over issues like free speech and the rest, within women's the Muslim rights. Within the Muslim community, not only throughout, throughout society, yes. within the Muslim community, of course there is. And there's that kind of intellectual debate that we need to have and we need to open the doors for. But what I find extremely unhelpful um, is the demand of Muslims to condemn their scripture, their religion. We, we don't go around demanding of Christians to, to, to condemn the Bible. We don't go around demanding of Jews to condemn the Torah simply because there is something there, something there. If taken out of context, it doesn't fit with my tastes and preferences in 2014. It is simple to me. Well, Killing a person and well, stoning a person is wrong. Is there a scale whereby we say that inject, injecting p uh, someone in Texas and leaving them it's to wrong. arrive to death is, well, are you demanding of the American government to say yes, that it's wrong? I have do, you have that kind of do you have that kind of debate? Have. You see, the thing is, do. I mean, of either we have, I, I, think, I think what Tariq Ramadan has said, and I think that that is something that we should take stock of. There is an internal debate. If we shut down the public debate, that internal debate will stop, simply because what will happen is that people will start pointing to Tariq Ramadan and accusing him of being a sellout. We can't have that. There are certain issues with British society, which is my society, my kids' society, yes. by the way, which I totally disagree with, but I allow there to be a debate, a social debate over time, so that we come to a particular point whereby smoking is not allowed in public places, whereby alcohol is not sold after a particular hour, and so on and so forth. We need time, we need to allow for that debate to take place. We need to give it oxygen. We mustn't be hypocritical about this. Okay. We must understand let's more. We must know what we're talking yes. about. Okay, well, let's bring in... <laughs> You've all been very patient. You've listened to us discuss Islamism, Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Islam and Europe, Sharia law, uh, stoning, etc., free speech. Let's go to the lady in the third row with glasses on your head to my left. Um, hi, you discuss in your writing the necessity of shifting authority within the Islamic world today. Where do you think the authority should lie and what are the necessary qu qualifications of authority? If we look at what is happening in the West today, we have sciences, but there is a lack of ethics. And you can't just ask the Muslim scholars to come with the Quran and the Sunnah and to give us the final word in sciences. They have to rely on other scholars. And this is why I don't call them specialists. I call them ulama. Ulama al waqa wa siyakh, meaning these are people who know about science, medicine. And in medicine, Muslims did very well. They are sitting together and they are coming with legal opinion. They rely on the knowledge of the medical doctors. I want us to do the same when it comes to food, when it comes to everything which has to do with experimental sciences and also human sciences. And I think that there is a problem. We have a problem of authority. There is an authority crisis within okay. the Muslim majority countries and the Muslim world. Let's take more question. Gentleman there in the tie. Actually, I have a, a, a unique question about what's the dealing, right? Do you think that the West are dealing with the Egyptian incident differently with the, uh, what happened in Ukraine? And what's the reason for this? I think it's, it's quite obvious that uh, uh, the West is dealing with or have been dealing with the Muslim Brotherhood and what happened in Egypt in a way which was not fair uh, for the people, the civilians who were killed. Islamists are perceived as a danger, a threat. The question is not to know if Muslims are ready for democracy. It, the true question is, is the West ready for Muslims to experience democracy? Gentleman here. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I just arrived from Egypt, and one question I'd like to ask you, which I know many Egyptians would like to know, is how do you compare the 
uh, leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood in your grandfather's time with the leadership uh, today, do you think that the uh, Supreme Guide now in prison, does he, ha does he have the same kind of management and leadership uh, style as your grandfather, or, or did the Muslim Brotherhood somehow lose the plot or, or deviate from your grandfather's thinking at some point? He was clearly uh, a charismatic leader with full of religious knowledge and he was a religious reference. He had a vision and he was very pragmatic. So this is one thing. Now, he had lots of power within the organization. Very old people were running the Muslim Brotherhood. The council was made of people that we can question the, the competence when it comes to the political understanding and the political decisions. So I would say that some of the young people within the Muslim Brotherhood were challenging this authority by saying, you are out of touch. You said at the start you don't believe they're a terrorist group or a violent organization. Or some of them. Do you think that's become a self-fulfilling prophecy? No, I, I, think that, I think that they are pushed to, become, uh, to be radicalized, which by the way is exactly what Nasser did in the yeah. 50s. Today, more than 30,000 people are in jail. There is torture. People are killed. And this is just unacceptable. Anyone in the West who is supporting democracy should be clear that this has been condemned and we cannot support anything which has to do with the Sisi. Sisi is a dictator and is as bad as Mubarak. That's full point, no discussion. And anyone who is playing with this, I would say double click. And yet, and yet he has amazing high approval ratings from Egyptians. That's or he will get 99% or 98% because they love him. It's a democratic election. You buy that? No, I I'm not talking about free and fair elections. I'm talking about the fact that he is clearly a popular figure in Egypt. You wouldn't deny that. No, I think that's, uh, he that's is the problem. popular. He, that's the problem. That's true. Okay, let's go to the audience here. Gentleman there uh, with his hand up. A lot of the criticisms you have of the Brotherhood appear to be tactical, appear to be strategic, appear to be organizational, appear to be structural, intergenerational. What do you disagree with them in terms of objectives and goals? Where do you lie with, okay, their broad vision and goal? And what are your specific clear-cut disagreements with them in that regard? The vision of the state and the discussion about the state, what is the civil state with uh, uh, the Islamic reference, I have a problem with this. The economic choice, which type of economy? I think that the problem that I have is that what I understood from the very beginning of what was the vision of political Islam was something which was close to liberation theology. It's not there at all. Okay, on so that no, note. no, 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 sorry. The second, the, 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 third, the third thing has to do with the, the social issues and the way we are dealing with women and education. I'm not talking about religious education, I'm talking about state education for all. Where is this? I don't get that. We have lots of questions from Muslims. Are there non-Muslims who want to ask questions? Gentlemen, every hand went round about this gentleman here. <laughs> uh, a Sudanese uh, legal scholar and human rights expert uh, once said that the safest place for a religious person, and he included Muslims in that, is a secular state. Do you agree with that claim? It depends the type of secular state you have. Why? Why? Because China and Russia were secular states where being a religious man or woman was for you to face discrimination. So don't idealize a secular state. If I had some of the French people in charge as secularists, I would go and get out of France because the way they deal with secularists is just a new dogmatic religion. Okay. So if, if by this you mean a secular state where all the religions are treated equally and they are treated by law what I'm expecting from Britain, what I'm expecting from France, is to apply the secular system 100% equal rights for all. Okay. If this is what you mean, yes. Lady there with the scarf. Um, considering we're yet to have an example of um, secular, secularism and democracy working in the MENA region and more examples of actually Islam and democracy working, such as Tunisia, which is often forgotten, we've got one of the first um, democratic constitutions in MENA. Is the premise of this whole show completely kind of invalid, considering it's actually the secularists that are yet to prove themselves in our region? Secularism in the Middle East has nothing to do with secularism in the West. 
while we are talking here about a democratic process, all the secularists in the Middle East were dictators. And even in Turkey, the people who are acknowledging and promoting secularism were people who were supporting the army, and the army okay. was against democracy. Let's so take a question from the back of the hall. The lady there with the glasses. Yep, you. Hi. Um, you mentioned that there was a crisis of authority, and I think that you continue to argue for contextualization, but don't you think an argument for contextualization and then mentioning that there's a crisis of authority will lead us to descend into relativism, and how will, the, how will you then address a crisis of authority if you're being so relativistic? Uh, that's, that's a very good question, and this is why we need this internal debate, because I'm not going to say because I live in Britain that's fine to drink alcohol and to go to pubs just to be within the culture. No, this is not going to happen in my discourse. Now, what I'm saying is that we live in societies where you need to get a better understanding of the history, collective psychology, and the culture. Even in, in Islamic terms, the term that you have to deal with the environment is al-ma'roof, known by the people as being good. Let us go for that. Let me finish by asking you this question. You're someone who has written a lot about bridging the so-called gap between Muslims and the West. You're saying there is no gap. Muslims are here. Take us seriously. Is there one thing you would say that Islam has to offer to Europe that Europe doesn't have on its own, that Islam can give to Europe? Three things. Oh, three. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the first one is, in fact, by our very presence, to help the West to reconcile itself with its very values. And is, I'm always saying this to Muslims, help your country to reconcile itself with the values of pluralism, equality, and to act against racism and this patronizing perception that, yes, you are British, but not yet as us. So we are going to change that. And this is our first contribution. The second one is the spiritual side, the very meaning of life. The way they see us practicing, questioning, ha giving some meaning to our life, this is a good contribution. Life is not about being economically or socially successful is to get this meaning, so the spiritual dimension. And the third one is to bring ethics into the discussion, that you can say there are things that you cannot do to nature, to your neighbor, and I want this to bring this. It doesn't mean that we have the monopoly, but our presence is a good reminder. So I am done with any discourse about integration. I'm opening the door for contribution. And these are three well, things that, that are important. Well, on that positive note, Professor Tariq Ramadan, thank you very much for joining thank us tonight you. on thank Head you to for Head. Inviting me. Thank you very much to our panel uh, for their contributions. Thank you very much uh, to the audience here in the Oxford Union and to the audience at home for watching Head to Head. We'll be back on Al Jazeera next week. Good night. <laughs>